Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this meal which we're about to receive through thy bounty. Amen. <laughs> we thank you, Lord, for the word of God which is our food, it is our sustenance, it is that which is supposed to give us strength. We thank you, Lord, that you took the time to have your people take the time to be anointed to write down your word so that we could have something to stand on. We ask, Jesus, that you would um, increase in me, Lord, the anointing, that it might be greater than my natural man. And I pray, Lord, that you would increase your spirit in your people and those who hear the message, that they might have motivation, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for every good thing you bring us. Amen. Well, today's message had a little bit of a difficultness getting its title, and this is what I've settled on. Mm -hmm. Beware the tired spirit. Now, you would think that out of the title that we're going to be having a message about how to, how to overcome tiredness and what steps to take, and it sounds like a self-help sermon, but it's really not. It's really more a sermon for you to consider the wedding is coming, and watch yourself. Now, if anybody has a problem with the spirit of hypnotism, please fight against it, because I'm going to be saying the word tired, sleeping, 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 tiredness, drowsiness, <laughs> throughout the message. I'm kidding. Nobody here has a susceptibility to the spirit of the hypnotism. <laughs> You know, the Lord's really generous in the way He gives us warnings and gives us scriptures that tell us about things to come and then turns around and says, and here's the problems. It's nice to know when you buy a car what the strengths and weaknesses are of that car. Here's your car. It's wonderful. Of course, the tailpipe's going to fall off in about a week and the distributor cap is corroded. It's nice to know what you're buying. It's nice to know what you're getting. And I think the Lord has been very generous in the fact that he has been willing to give prophecy. And he has been willing to say, I'm going to show you things ahead of time. But there's this strange little uh, hook to it. I'm going to show you what it can do, but you're going to have to make sure you put gas in it. You better make sure you check the tires every rotation, you know. There are things that you have to do that go along with things that I have to do. That's what prophecy is. I'm going to take this action and you're going to have this reaction. Now if you have this reaction, I'm going to have that reaction. And if you do this, then I'll do that. But here's the events that are coming and here are things that are going to happen. And some of these, after a while, you listen to these warnings of Scripture and you just kind of yawn your way around them a little bit because you've heard them too much. Or you've heard too many people try to change what the basic meaning is of the prophetic statement. Who can know? And you get kind of a blase eh, out of it. But you know, matter, you know, no matter what we argue over or debate over or what we think a verse about prophecy is about, Hiding in those verses are honest concerns of God, <laughs> of things that you should watch for, for yourself, as you wait for the fulfillment of prophecy. And prophecy is not something that, that once it's told to you and you have the knowledge of it, guarantees that you too will be a part of that prophecy. Because prophecy has with it the if condition that's always hiding in the background. If, if, and don't forget the rest of the Bible that isn't prophetic. Because it all has a play. When I started to put this message together, I thought it was going one way. And then it went another way. And then it came back upon itself. So, first we're going to go through verses. And I'm going to preach off those verses. And in the midst of all of those verses, I'm going to commingle with that the point that I think is the heartbeat that God is going after. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven 
be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he said, answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I do not recognize you. I don't recognize him. Watch ye therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now I'm going to tell you something right off that is going to upset some people. This is not talking about the second coming. Do you know how I know it's not talking about the second coming right off the bat? At the second coming of Christ, when he returns, as it was stated in Acts, in the same manner that you saw him go up, he's going to come down. He says in another verse, don't go to the hills or the desert or whatever when people say that Christ is there. Because when Christ returns, in the same manner as he went up, he's coming down. Absolutely visibly. Everybody's going to know it's him. And when he returns, he's coming to set up the kingdom on earth. This parable starts out with, let me tell you a tale of the kingdom of getting into the kingdom of heaven. Let me tell you a tale about what it takes to get in there for the marriage entrance. He starts off down at the bottom here. He says, you neither know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Cometh for what? Cometh for the wedding guests. For the wedding virgins. This is not talking about the coming of Christ to judge the world and execute judgment upon the ungodly for all the ungodly deeds which the ungodly have committed. Book of Jude. This is not the returning of Christ with his saints to execute judgment upon the earth and to rule with a rod of iron and smash him with a potsherd. This is the coming or the calling of the Son of Man and the wedding feast. The event of the heavenly century. <laughs> the long-awaited completion that preps, that brings together Christ and his church. When you stop to consider that he says, you don't know what day that's going to be. You don't know when that event's going to happen. Between now and then, a number of things are going to happen. And it's going to seem like such a long time before it happens that a whole lot of people are going to get very, very sleepy. You thought it was going to happen right after I left. You thought this great wedding was going to happen instantly. And then I took a whole lot longer than you expected. See, when Christ returns to judge the earth and rule the earth and divide the sheep nations from the goat nations and take over rulership and conquer the world and throw the Antichrist and toss off the false prophet and kick the devil out in, in the edge, that's not a wedding. That's a conquering king coming into triumph with his court. That's a heavenly conquering to earth. This is a we-going-to-them picture, not a he-coming-to-us picture. This is the bridegroom. This is not a war scene. This is not a, a judgment scene. This is not an attack-upon-mankind scene. You don't see anything in this that says, and hailstones are coming out of the sky, and the sun's being turned to darkness, and the world's going up in flames, and 
great earthquakes, and then I shall come and you shall come into the marriage feast. What it says is, watch out. You don't know when this is coming. You have no idea when this event is going to happen because the cry is going to come out at midnight. In the middle of night, it's going to show up. Not in the middle of my day, the day of the Lord, the starting of the new day. This is going to come in the middle of the night. This is a surprise event. The second coming is not a surprise event. The second coming is a blatant, the world's hell in a handbasket. It's been pummeled by the plagues. Everybody's looking up going, what is going on here? They're cursing God's face. They're attacking Christ's name. They're trying to kill off whatever Christians are around, if there are any around. I leave that on the side for the moment, depending on your post-prid, pre-trib, mid-trib, no-trib, up-trib, you know what I'm saying. But the point here is, this is a nighttime visitation. This is a surprise. This is not, oh, here he's just about to come. Believe you me, after you've read the book of Revelation, and then you see that Christ is coming, and it says, you know, now has come salvation, and now we're going to do these things, and now it's going to happen, I mean... If you're living in that time period, you've seen the mark of the beast. You've seen the, the, the devastation on planet Earth. And you know that this all came out of the heavens. It's not Christ coming to set up his kingdom on Earth. This is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And Christ is talking to the people of his day saying, Here is what you need to watch out for if you expect to make it in the way <coughs> If you expect to be part of the bride, if you expect to be part of the Lamb's wife, you have to be ready. If you expect to be an attendant at the wedding, you have to be ready. By the time we're done with this message, there's four or five other passages I'm going to go to that are all wedding passages. There's all kinds of people at this wedding. This is an event that shows Christ... Christ and his bride and the crier and everybody else are all prepped. And the attendants are the ones that are running behind. When you consider that Jesus is talking to Israel when he says this, <clears throat> this is not a good thing. They're about now going, what do you mean? How could, how could that be? How could there be foolish virgins and wise, wise virgins? Who are you talking about anyway? Talking about the Sadducees or the Pharisees? You can just see the two camps pointing at each other, you know. Are we talking about the Amaharez Jew who's over there and he's not going to be ready? Yeah, those little scumbuckets over there, they aren't going to have oil in their lap, but we're going to have oil in our lap. We're going to be ready. Yes, we are. Praise God. We're the religious system of the day. Of course we're going to be ready. And yet it's kind of ironic that the whole parable of the kingdom of heaven, this particular parable, isn't talking about the bride. The bride, she's already in another scene. She's already took care of. She's already prepped, ready, and coming. This whole event is already happening with the bride and bridegroom. This is about the attendants. This is about the virgins. This is about those who are part of the feast. These are the ones who will make it in the door to the kingdom of heaven and those who won't. You have to consider for a moment the way this thing's written. It says they're foolish. They're foolish. Now what's really funny is it says they all slumbered and slept. That's not funny. But it's funny. Because all this while we've been worrying about the slumbered and slept part. And this message is about the slumbered and slept part. But the issue is, when it comes time to wake up, the oil is going to become the issue, not the slumbered and slept part. That tells me that God is going to wake up his church. That tells me the crier portion of his church is going to make a really loud proclamation right about midnight. Now, if you're sound asleep in your bed and all of a sudden a really loud bang happens or a really loud noise happens or, you know, some siren blows off like when I was a kid and I lived on an Air Force base, what do you do at midnight when a loud noise takes place? You jump like, ha! Ah! Oh, my, it's happening. Quick, gather up your lamps. Hurry up. we got to get this stuff together. Oh, my goodness. Hear them. I can hear them coming down across the hill. Trumpet is blowing. Noise of singing saints. The ones that have gone before are coming. The ones that come before are coming. Wow. Oh, boy. we got to get ready. Oh, hey. 
Hey, wait a minute. I can't get my lamp started. Hey, I can't get my lamp started. Man, I'm really groggy. God, I gotta get ready here fast, fast. Well, at least I'm dressed. <laughs> they go to trim the lamps and nothing comes up. They go to trim the lamps and nothing comes up. And they're going, I can hear them coming. Give me some of your oil. This is only going to take a minute. I, I've got enough time. If you just give me some of your oil. Give me a little bit of your anointing. Give me a little bit of your spirit. Give me a little bit of your infilling. Give me a little bit of your Holy Ghost. I, I, I'm a Christian. Ain't I a Christian? All Christians are alike, right? We're all even. We're all wearing the robes. We're all virgins. We're all wearing white. We're all waiting. We're all sleeping. Well, we were all sleeping, right? So, you know, just a little oil. But, see, it's a stupor. They're, they're moving in a stupor. See, if it was the second coming... There would be this gigantic set of uh, saints and angels showing up at the door going, bam, 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 bam. Hello, we're here. No, this is a procession out here. And they're like, we got to get up there. we got to get up there now. And the wise ones said, yeah, but you don't understand. We need enough light, our own light, to make sure we can get all the way to the feast. we got to make sure we can make it in the procession. We can't afford to give you any of our, if, any of our oil. If we give you our oil, there won't be enough. We won't see our way. It's in midnight. It's dark. See, we're a little bit spoiled in modern times, I think, in that we have lights everywhere. And it's really cool, I like doing this, to drive down through nighttime Seattle and see all those beautiful lights. Or to fly in from an airplane, you know, late at night like I have done on recent occasion. And I look down, and here's this valley of lights. Lights everywhere. Lights. Little pinpoints of light. Little teeny lamps. Electric lamps. We call them light bulbs. Little lamps. Everywhere. We are so used to having light at night that I can actually stand up on my hill over here and look at Kent and see the light reflecting off the sky from the light bulbs down below at night. But you get to eastern Washington, you go to some place where there isn't a lot of that, mm -hmm. and d d d midnight's midnight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> midnight is you're walking uh, uh, down a path trying to figure out how to get someplace, and yeah, the stars are up there, so you at least know there's light, but you don't know what you're tripping over. You better have a lamp, or you can't see where to walk. And even if the guy in front of you has a lamp, you can't see where to walk, because the black is too black. The night is too dark. There is coming a time when darkness is going to cover this land so dark, it'll be midnight. It isn't going to be twilight like it is right now. It's going to get darker and darker and darker and darker. It's going to get quieter, spiritually speaking, and it's going to get harder, spiritually speaking. Somewhere, however, there are people getting ready for a feast. Somewhere there are people getting ready to go cry out across the land. Somewhere there are people sleeping. I said the title of this message is Beware of the Tired Spirit. What caused the virgins to sleep? They got tired. They waited so long. Now, having had a recent uh, bout with this subject, I find it rather painful that sometimes I'm perfectly alert and then as I'm sitting, waiting, 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 waiting five minutes disappeared. Hey, that's not fair. Waiting, the very act of waiting, slows you down. What do you do while you're waiting? You sit in the doctor's office and you're waiting. You sit in the dentist's office and you're waiting. You know what I'm saying? It's very easy when you're in a sedate position to go 90-90. When you're in a sedate position, it's very easy to just kind of, you know, it was a nice church service. Well, what happened? Well, you know, it was a nice church service. And what did the preacher preach on? Well, I don't know. I was kind of mentally groggy, I think, because it kind of went right by me, I think. The spirit of man sleeping. The trimming of the lamps is going to be the problem. The buying of the oil is definitely an issue, but you know what? If they'd have been awake and testing their lamps, they'd have known they were short, could have gone to the merchants in time, fetched enough oil, and been back in time for the wedding. The problem is twofold. The first fold is you weren't awake. The second fold was you didn't prep. 
the end result is the Lord says, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you. There is something about the lamp also that I, I realize in that statement. At first, I've always taken this as the Lord looks at him and says, says that in essence, you're not saved. You're not saved. I don't even know you. I know you not. And when you couple it with the other verse that people like mishing in, mishing, smooshing into this verse, they tend to grab the other one that says, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, and they shove it into this scenario. It's actually in a different context. But he said, I don't know you. I don't recognize you. There's something your lamp does get you. You can put it up next to your face when you come to the door. It's me. It's me, John. Oh, I guess it is. But what if your lamp's dark? What if your lamp's dim? You don't have. You went to go get and it's too late. And the porch light's off. And there's not enough, enough light to recognize you. You're the porter at the door. And you're looking out through the port, to the porthole. And you're looking into all that blackness. And here's a human being standing there. It's a little hard to recognize somebody on your porch if the porch light's off. Yeah. It's a little hard to recognize somebody if there's no light on their face. It's really tough to recognize a, a Christian from a Christian if there's no glow of Moses. <laughs> but when there's a glow of Moses, everybody says... Either more or cover the face. There's only two reactions to a glow. That's the way Christianity is. So you can get five or six foolish virgins side by side in the dark, and you can't quite tell which one's which. You kind of get the idea they're Christians because the robe is white. You kind of get the idea that they're virgins, but you're not sure about that. <laughs> they might not be. I know, bad statement, Anthony. But the point is, when you have light and you're trimmed and it's bright, it's trimmed light, it's not dim light, it's trimmed light. Your wick is fully functional, your oil is strong. You know what I'm saying? You're coming in the dark and there's lights everywhere. But you see, this door was closed. It says the door was shut. What door? See, if this was the second coming, the door is open. If it's the second coming, it says when the Lord returns, the whole earth is going to know who the Lord is. That's not a shut door. That's an open door. That's a door of complete demonstration. And anybody's going to be able to get at Christ who wants to. Because the message is going to cover the earth, and all who will to the Lord will come. And Israel's going to go out and go grab anybody who wants to come. And the, and the Israelites that have been scattered across the globe are going to be gathered together to come to the temple of Ezekiel, to come together. They're all going to be gathered together to a very open door. This event is a closed-door timed event. I don't believe this is talking about the second coming at all. I believe it's talking about preparing yourself for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. From a certain perspective, one could say, without, without a real difficulty, this is the end of your life. Knock, knock, I'm here. You know not what hour the Lord is going to come to claim your soul. Are you sleeping? Is he going to ask you to come at a time when your lamp's not ready? Or will you be able to be like Paul and say, I finished my race, I've done my course, I'm finished, I did well. When I talk to you, I talk to me. When I talk to us, I talk to them. Anybody listening? We have an unfortunate condition of apathy going on in the church. We have an unfortunate condition of tired, worn-out saints. We have a condition of we really do want to be in that company, in that number, but it just seems to be going on so long. The bridegroom, he's awake. The crier, awake. The bride, awake. But what about the attendants? What about those who are part of the feast? What about those that Christ is talking to? He's trying to tell them something. He's trying to tell his own people something very, very crucial. He's saying to Israel and he's saying to the church, and he's saying to his disciples, watch, be ready, be vigilant, be on your guard. Realize that times and seasons are in my hand. 
but I am going to come in the middle of the night. Now another point. Judgment comes as a thief in the night. You go read the Thessalonians passages that deal with the return. You'll find he comes as a thief of the night. But the children of light are not going to be surprised by things. They're not supposed to be. The virgins weren't surprised about a wedding. They knew it was coming, weren't they? They were all ready for it. Nobody said they wouldn't know about the event. The prophecies are clear. We will know the events. And we should be preparing ourselves. We should wash our robes. We should get our hair ready. Make sure we got our makeup on. <laughs> you know, make sure that our, our, uh, our, our flowers are wrapped around our wrists and whatever decorations we're supposed to be wearing in the Lord and our jewels are on our, our garments. And, you know, we're supposed to be ready. We have enough prophecy to know what the future is. To get ready. But we also need to not forget our own prep time. Our individual prep time. We need to make sure that we stay awake. Some would say, well, I'm not going to worry about falling asleep because it says they all woke up. <laughs> hmm. I'm not sure that's what the Lord meant. <laughs> I don't think he said, it's okay, I don't mind if you sleep. I'm just worried about your oil. In fact, if you make sure you have enough oil ahead of time, go ahead and sleep. Not a problem. I don't think so. I think he would rather have us be criers. I think he would rather have us uh, spiritually change companies. <laughs> just because these virgins are mentioned, and just because some of them are going to get in the door, and just because some of them did it right, doesn't mean that's the only company in the story. There is the crier company. Boy, it's going to be interesting to see that crier company. Generation after generation has had preachers, evangelists, miracle workers who have stood up and cried with a loud voice, the wedding is coming, the wedding is coming. And every generation the church has gone one of two things. Yawn or get ready. Yawn, or get ready. How fast are you moving? Well, I don't know if prayers, you know, I don't know if that's important. How much oil do you need? Are you going to them who sell oil? Who are them who sell oil anyway? Who are these people that are awake that I could go get more oil from them? Hmm. Go get oil, it said. Go to the merchants. Get it. That means somebody's anointed. Somebody's got it. Maybe this church isn't anointed, and that church is anointed, and that church knows how to sell oil, but this church don't know how to sell oil. It's not just the virgins who have oil. It's the merchants who have oil, too. So where are the great caches of oil? Oil runs our planet right now, doesn't it? Different kind of oil, but it's oil. Imagine for a moment if all of a sudden all the oil refineries just went to sleep. Oh, for about ten years. What do you think? Ten years? How about ten minutes? Yeah. Ten minutes of, looks like we're not going to get gas at the gas station in the 1970s, and my goodness, the lines took place. Ten minutes. We may never see oil again. It's amazing to me that in the natural man, we can be so diligent to hunt and worry and go after oil. In the spiritual man, it's like, oh, i got enough. I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm in the kingdom. All Christians are created equal. You can't call me unanointed. I'm anointed just like the rest of you. i got a lamp. i got a lamp. Yeah, but how much oil do you have is the issue. God gives a measure of his spirit to every man. But then you're supposed to do more. My whole point in this and the whole drive in this, I think, is get ready, get ready. Watch both sleepy time and oil collection. Watch them both. But I guarantee you the first problem is the sleepy time. Because if you'd have been awake sooner, you would have realized you were short of oil. And you'd have had time to go to the merchants and come back and been fine. Matthew 13:28. Another parable. Another truth alongside reality. <laughs> Another picture within a picture for your viewing pleasure. 
Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, we know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when you see, oh, see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the door. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour no man knoweth, no, not the angel which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. Yeah, I'd say he's far. <laughs> Who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch watch ye therefore for you know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping and what I say unto you all, I say unto you and I caught this verse for the first time, really. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. I'm saying it to you, but I want everybody who ever reads this for the rest of generations to catch the point. It's not just for them. It's not just for the people I'm talking to. It's for everybody to know. Your responsibility is to watch. Now, somebody who watches doesn't just stand up on the wall and go, hmm, hmm, hmm. Somebody who watches is in preparation. Somebody who watches is making sure they're ready. I mean, imagine for a moment watchmen on the walls of a city, okay? And, and there hasn't been an attack on the city in five years. Their job is to watch, right? They're doing their job. Their eyes are open, right? But they never bothered to sharpen their sword. They haven't checked to see if the wood in their javelin is still you know, solid, that moisture didn't corrode it away. They haven't bothered to look at their shield, you know, they've had it on their back all this time, walking around, walking around, walking around. Didn't realize the leather straps are starting to get a little bit corroded, you know, so when they really need it on their arm and something hard hits it, it just kind of pops right off the arm. They didn't pay attention to any of that, but they watched by God. They were prepared. Aren't we all watchmen? Aren't we the same? We're all watchmen. We're all supposed to be paying attention. The Lord said so. So I'm paying attention. I'm awake. See, now I'm awake. I'm okay. But there's a se second problem here. Not only is my armor maybe not quite ready, just like my oil wasn't quite ready, there's this sleepy problem. See, one of the things that can happen to watchmen on a wall or watchmen at a, uh, at a door or MPs at the, at the military base gate or the ambassadorial door or the, uh, you know, the Tower of London or wherever is the longer you stand waiting, like this, perfectly still. Nobody's coming. Nobody's attacking. Nobody came yesterday. Nobody came the day before. We haven't had a war in 15 years. There's nothing going to harm us. We're perfectly fine, perfectly fine. We got our military. They're out there and around and about. We got our armory. We know we're safe. We're behind thick walls. We're perfectly safe, perfectly safe, perfectly safe. I'm leaning up against the wall. I'm perfectly safe. Oh, yeah, I'm perfectly safe. That's true. If I lean just a little bit, I can still look like I'm standing. And I can just kind of let my eyes go down just a little bit. Just a little bit. Not too much. Just a little bit. I'm still awake. I'm still awake. I can hear. My ears are working just fine. My eyes are closed. But I'm aware. I'm, I'm not asleep. I'm aware. I'm aware. I'm still aware. I'm still here. See, the problem is the weight. The weight gets you. In the middle of the night especially... Chirp, 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 chirp. Hoo-hoo! Hoo-hoo! Rrrr! <laughs> really bad, Wolf. But you get my point. The guard, the, the, the guard at the gate, the MP at the door, the, the longer you hear chirp, chirp, and tweet, tweet, and hoo-hoo, and, you know, it's all very rhythmic, very peaceful, very wonderful, very, and this wall is solid, and, well, you know, even if I'm just leaning on my spear, you know, my javelin, I, I mean, even if I'm just leaning on my, you get my point? Your heart was good when you started your Christianity. You were prepared for battle. You were prepared if the enemy came sneaking up in the middle of the night, you'd stomp on his nose. But, you know, he's smart. He says, I think I'll back off a little while. I'll just leave you to your Christianity. I'm not going to even bother to attack you. I'm just going to let you alone. 
And then all of a sudden, he takes two planes and crashes them into you. All of a sudden, he sneaks in the door and stabs you. All of a sudden, he takes a tree and cracks your house in half. All of a sudden, he shows up out of nowhere. You weren't watching. Jesus is warning and warning and warning through scriptures all the time, saying, look out for the weight. The weight's going to really get you. Look out for this tired spirit. Look out for the fact that all these things are going to happen, and, and you're going to have to wait a while. He said, take heed, watch and pray. And pray. He didn't say just watch. He said watch and pray. You watch a church service on TV, what are you doing? You better be doing more than watching. You read the news. You're watching the news. You're paying attention to current events to see what's going on in politics, what's going on in church, what's going on in economics. But you don't pray. You watch yourself. You make sure that you're walking the best Christian walk you can. You don't do this, you don't do that, you don't do this, but you sleep. I, I'm, just, I'm just a guard, you know. And I'm a really good guard. The Son of Man took a far journey. You know, in the old days when they said a man took a far journey, it was a far journey. <laughs> you know, when we take a far journey, it's two and a half hours. If it's a really far journey, it's four and a half hours. If it's a cross-the-planet journey, it might take us 12 hours. When they took a far journey, see in a couple of years, that's a far journey. When you sent your letter by, you know, traveling horse and rider, you know, you didn't go to the mailbox the next morning and go, how come they haven't written me back yet? <laughs> I haven't gotten an email response from you since yesterday. I've been watching for your email. You haven't written me. It was six hours ago. Yeah, there's our Christianity in type right there. Christ went away. He should have been back by now. We should have had a revival by now. He's taken too long. I'm dead right. What kind of patience of the saints do we have? Where's my revival? I ordered it up yesterday. It should have been in the kitchen cooking by now. I'm not giving no tip to God today, that's for sure. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. However, they might take a while to get fulfilled. They might take a while to come to pass. This generation, this generation, he's measuring e an event by generation. <laughs> okay, 40, 50, 100. What's a generation? Big debates out there. What's well, a generation? Point is, it ain't tomorrow morning, but it might be yesterday. <laughs> when this generation starts seeing these things being done, these world events, these events that I told you about, this prophecy, when you start seeing it happen, pay attention, be praying, be watching, be looking, your Redeemer cometh, lift up, unbow yourself, all these warnings of Scripture. Prepare! All of a sudden, I'm not feeling too comfortable in my Christianity. All of a sudden, my, my shoes strings are a little tight. You know, all of a sudden, I'm like, I guess I haven't done enough yet. Oh, my. It says the Son of Man taking a far journey left his house. Yeah, it looks that way, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a little facetious. <laughs> the church is being run by servants. It looks like he's left his house. Nah, he's coming around. He's coming around. Thank God for the anointing. Thank God for the presence of God that comes down. Thanks God for the infilling. Thank God for the fact that he's willing to work with us. Because he could have just left the house empty, quiet and still, cloth over the top of all the furniture so we couldn't use any of the gifts, waiting for the day he came back home. No, he left us the house fully functional. We get to use everything in his wonderful house. We get to eat off of his gold plates. We get to use his silverware. We get to sit in the cushy chairs that we can't sit in when Master's home because, you know, if you ever caught us sitting in that chair, you know what I'm talking about. We, we do our thing. You know, we're servants. It's like, oh, wouldn't it be fun? Come on, if you went to the White House and the President wasn't in the White Room and you were there alone, wouldn't you want to just kind of slide around the table and sit down in the presidential chair for two seconds? To feel what it's like to be in that presidential chair. Come on. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, God has given us all of this to enjoy. But, remember the purpose. 
prepare for when the master returns. Don't hesitate. Wait, watch, pray. You have authority as servants. You have the fivefold ministry to run the church. Use it wisely. Use it smartly. Take care of the servants. Watch out for the family. Just because the master's gone for a trip doesn't mean you get to abuse his family. Right and it says he commands the porter to watch. Reminds me of the other verse. You know, any man that comes up any other way is a thief and a robber, but him who comes by the porter, even the porter's on duty. <laughs> the butler. <laughs> James is on duty. <laughs> And the limo is waiting. The golden chariot is out in the parking lot. Take a little humor in it, but swallow the pill. Enjoy the flavor. It's going to churn in your tummy. We must work against sleep. Because if he comes suddenly, if he came right now, he just showed up. Are you asleep? <laughs> doot, doot, doot. Oh, I tell you, sometimes I, I have to admit, as as a um, a man who had great ambitions, and then a man who had no ambitions, and a man who's now saying, okay, I better have better ambitions than these. I wonder sometimes if Jesus Christ were to show up this second, figuratively speaking, what would I be doing in that second? Ooh, how many of my seconds a day, if he were to show up, would I be embarrassed if he showed up? <laughs> How? There are ministers and there are Christians who would not be embarrassed if he showed up. Because he would find them busily doing that which he told them to do. It says he gave every man his work. We all have our tasks. Look at my calling! Look at my calling! Look at my calling! Yeah, you're all a bunch of servants with tasks. Quit trying to strut, uh, uh, strut against your fellow servant. You know, look at me, I'm wearing the butler's robes. Look at me, I'm wearing the cook's robes. Look at me, I'm wearing the... Oh, shut up. Luke twelve thirty six. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Help me, God. <laughs> Luke twelve thirty six. And ye yourselves liken to men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth to serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. You have to realize that the plan of God for Israel is, when Christ returns after the wedding, everybody else gets to be attended to. That's what it says. Caught me this morning. Caught me by surprise. He might come in the third watch, the second watch, the fourth watch of the night. You don't know, Israel, when he's coming. You don't know. See, this you've got to understand that these warnings that Christ is giving are both to Israel and the church. You can see the mixture. This one, this verse, which is a different verse set, says, Pay attention. The Lord, when he shall come, find watching. Very well, said he shall gird himself, sit down and have meat with you. But you better have your door ready to be knocked on. <laughs> Behold, I come to the door. Knock, knock. Can I come and have din din? And Israel goes, We recognize thou not, for the Messiah has not yet come. Whoops. No, the scriptures say that when he returns, they're going to look upon him whom they pierced, and they're going to recognize who's at the door. Hmm. But in the wedding picture we saw ahead of time, everybody had to recognize who the criers were so they could go toward the wedding. So they could be prepped. I have much more to study on prophecy, and I admit that I'm not an expert on these things, as I think many aren't. But it does kind of strike a point here. We have different events that Christ keeps trying to address in front of his people. He's teaching the apostles, and he's trying to teach Israel, and he's saying, look out. Church, look out. Israel, look out. Church, look out. Israel, look out. Disciples, look out. Pharisees, look out. <laughs> yes, when he will return from the wedding, when he will return from having gone far away, when he will return from, will he find you sleeping? 
He will come and serve them. Did you know that? When Jesus returns, he will serve them. He will watch over them. He will take care of them. He's going to set up a kingdom for the remaining ones, the remnant, and he is going to have a feast with them. And they are going to rejoice that the Lord has come to their house. And the wedding party will be with him. <laughs> Matthew 22, verse 1 and following. Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. Son and bidden. Oh, this wedding's real interesting. And they would not come. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. It's ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Enter the Dark Ages. And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. No, there's not going to be any judgment. God loves us all equally. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. Oh, great. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. These are the guests we're talking about. Somebody has to be at the wedding. They all have to know that it's a wedding. They all have to see who Christ and his bride is. They will bow down in front of your feet, Revelation 3, and attest that indeed you are who you are. No, all Christians are created equal, and the world is all serving the same God. Right. The wedding will be furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. Somebody tried to sneak into the room. I'm as good as everybody else. I can sit here. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Yeah, you're caught. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now watch this next verse. Because I could stop right there and start talking, but the next verse really sinks the boat. Then went the Pharisees, having heard all this, and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. They start setting up schemes. They start fulfilling the very verses he's talking about. To go slay the servants, kill the ones that God sends, you know, wipe out the criers if possible. But you see, the truth of the matter is, this is an end-time scenario in parable. Remember, it's a parable. It's a truth along the truth. In the heavens, these events are unfolding, just like it shows in Revelation. But on earth, these events are unfolding, just like it shows in the book of Revelation. And what's happening is, there's warnings. And the warning here is pretty strong. Pretty strong. The guests of the wedding are going to be tested three different ways. Some are going to go, I don't, I don't care about religion. I, I don't have time for no wedding feast stuff. Come, partake and see that the Lord is good. Enjoy his presence. Be partakers of the divine nature. Consume the presence of God. Drink from the fountain of God. Step up to Joel's bar, whatever you want to call it. The great feast. And they're going to go, no, nah, I don't think so. And the next set are going to go, no, and matter of fact, we don't, we're really getting tired of you, you gospel salesmen. We're going to start killing you. That's it. We're wiping you out. You disciples, we're going to hang you upside down, boil, boil you in oil, and we're going to do a few things. See, it doesn't say every 
every Christian has that happen. It just says, slew some of the servants. But the problem is, that's what's starting to happen, isn't it? Yeah. We're seeing it here a little, there a little. God, every generation sends ministers and saints and people who just want to share the good news, and what do they get for it? Do they get praise? Do they get gratitude? Yes, when the person gives their heart to the Lord. No, when they don't. But what is God, the king, the king? Remember, this is the parable of the king making a wedding for his son. Mm -hmm. The king is going to be very upset, and unfortunately judgment will come. The day of the Lord is terrible darkness, terrible punishment by all the verses in the Old Testament. It's never good when the king says, I've had enough of this. I'm tired of your watchmen. I'm tired of your sacrifices. I'm tired of your music. I'm tired of what you're doing. You're not doing it to me. Now I'm going to make me a new kingdom. I was thinking the other day, just as a tangent, but I was thinking the other day, it's a couple of days ago, about the end of and beginning of the millennium. The end of the time of the Gentiles going into the beginning of the millennium. And the fact that there's going to be a remnant of Israel saved. And out of that a whole new world's going to come. Israel shall be saved. I was reading that verse. All of Israel shall be saved. Some people would think, yeah, that means they're all born again. Perhaps. Perhaps it's just that they're all saved. <laughs> they're rescued. They're set aside. They still have to walk out their salvation with fear and trembling. They're no different than us. They're not going to be, you know, Calvinistically, instantly, permanently for a thousand years saved. They're going to have to work it out, just like we worked it out. But it dawned on me what God was doing. He was doing Noah all over again. It's Noah all over again. I'm going to save me a remnant and start me all over. It's the statement he said to Moses. Let me wipe these people out and out of your loins I'll raise up a new nation. God knows how to prune back a bush all the way down to the last little thing coming out of the ground and said, well, we'll make me a new one. That is why the world is going to get plunged into catastrophe. Cataclysm. Earthquake. That is why um, meteors are going to fall out of the sky and the heavens are going to roll back and the moon's going to turn to blood so that he can pull aside Noah and his family. But it be between now and then, what does Noah's job? What is Noah's job? Get as many in the ark as possible and send out the warning that rain is coming. That's the job. To be the crier, to stand out and say, the wedding, the wedding, the wedding, it's coming. You know? The king will even take servants who try to sneak in on the feast and say, I'm sorry, but you don't have the right garment. You didn't put on Christ, you put on somebody else. What are you trying to get into my feast for? So people don't get it. Christians are not trying to say they're superior. Christians are trying to say God has made a plan. And that plan is one man, one plan. If you come in with a garment that is not the garment he told you to put on, you did not put on Christ. You don't have the correct garment. Go up to a restaurant, read the sign. No shoes, no shirt, no service. If ye being evil can make a rule like that, can God not certainly make the same? Come on. No Christ, no anointing, no lamp, no entry. Mm -hmm. It's a serious matter to fall asleep. It's a serious matter to fall into apathy. It's a serious matter to just wait so long that you give up. I better move on or I'll never finish the message. Luke 14, 58. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. And when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he hath bid thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. What have I said for years? I'm not as much worried about the prophets that come to, down, to town with a flare. I'm worried about the quiet ones that are coming into services. You know, 
Today so-and-so has come to bless us with a message. And some dude on a cane or whatever comes walking up looking like locusts and honey on his breath and steps up to the pulpit and goes, I'm just here to tell you what the Lord's told me. No big deal. Big deal. <laughs> and I'm going to bless as many people as, a, as the Lord allows me to, so don't get all shook up about it. And if miracles happen while I'm preaching, just let it happen, okay? Just don't worry about it. All right? don't, don't, don't interrupt my sermon just because somebody barks or does this or does that or over there. Just let it happen. You pay attention to what I'm telling you. And if God were to raise them all from the dead, don't worry about it right now because right now I just got to get this word out because that's what the Lord gave me to get out, so that's what I'm getting out. See? The humble one walking into the feast. You walking into the feast humbly. You never know. William Branham went to a meeting and sat in the back row, as it were, and hid, and, and somebody said, we understand that there's a preacher by the name of William Branham. Um, no. <laughs> no, not here. And the guy next to him said, aren't you William Branham? Uh, no, <laughs> not here. <clears throat> I would say that was humble. Maybe even a little bit cowardly, but humble. I, how would you feel? You know, I know how I feel. I would, I would, I would have a certain amount of dread. Go into a meeting and and you're going to a place and nobody's supposed to know you. And what do you run into? Somebody you just talked to yesterday. Doesn't it just get you when that happens? Mm -hmm. You know, or or like me coming all the way to the United States as a kid and. And I'm not even here a year, and the first person I run into from, from Bitburg, Germany, is the guy that was my adversary over the same girl. I couldn't meet a thousand other kids from that school. No, I had to run into him. So God could make sure I took care of that matter. <laughs> you know, when you go to, this, go to a place, you don't want to be the one walking up to going, I'm the apostle of God, and I'm here to inform you that all of us should be underneath me. <laughs> run, duck! Even if it's true, run, duck. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, we don't know who all we is. But the wedding is getting made. The wedding feast is getting set up. God is gathering together into his houses, bad and good, guests at the wedding. Some of those guests are not really guests. They're guys sitting at lower seats who are going to get to go sit in higher seats. They're humble, humble, humble ones that one day God's going to go, you're now a prophet. Ready? You're now evangelist. Ready? You're now an intercessor. Ready? Ooh, don't talk about these things. Why not? You're part of the wedding feast. There's nothing more nervousing, in my opinion, nervousing, here's a word for you, nervousing, than to be in a room and know that you're qualified to do something and they don't seem to have somebody who can do it and they're looking around going, does anybody around here know how to play the piano? Thank God I don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, people want to come to church services and not be known for their gifts sometimes. And then they find out that the pianist was sick that day and there's only two in the room and one isn't volunteering, you know? <laughs> then there's the other person who comes in and I'm the pianist. No, oh, I'm, I'm ready. I'm better than that guy, bless God. Usually the anointing is on me compared to that guy. <laughs> uh, watch your role in the wedding feast. Be careful of your attitude. But realize that God is in the business of moving people in their chairs. Uh, when he does come to get you, don't be asleep. It's just going to make it tougher. I, I tell you, it would be very embarrassing. It would. I, I admit it would. Ray McCauley one time said that, that uh, you know he works with Reinhard Bonnke. And he says, following Reinhardt, is, I think he said, was following Reinhardt was like following a fast-moving train or something like that. Fast-moving something. Because all of a sudden, when the Spirit of the Lord hits Reinhardt, he's gone. And he perfectly expects you to catch his coat as it's flying through the sky. you got a job to do. You're, you're here. Get ready for the wedding feast. Maybe you're a guest. Maybe you're not the bride. Oh, I hope you're the bride. Prepare to be the bride. But prepare to be in a wedding feast. Everybody's going to see this one. It's as spectacular. Christ is coming back from the wedding. And he's going to bring his bride. And he's going to bring his court. And they're going to set up a kingdom. 
And we will rule and we will reign if we've been faithful in the little things. Because that world that he's coming back to is a mess. He's going to need rulers to help the rulers. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 14 and following. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Wake up! See then that thou walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine. It's really not a good idea for a watchman to be drunk. Wherein is excess? But be filled with the Spirit, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, speaking to yourself, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Yeah, that will keep you awake. Mm -hmm. You bet it will. The spirit within you will keep you awake. Ever have a really bad day? And forget to turn on the spiritual music to chase the demons away? Yeah. And then the next day, you just don't know why, you turn on the music and grab the song, and then the Lord anoints that song, and then you just have a great day? Mm -hmm. giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church and he's the savior of the body therefore as the church is subject unto Christ so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loves his wife loves himself. For no man hath ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself, and wife see that she reverence her husband. And you see how Paul just kind of moves backward and forward between Christ and the bride. Christ and the bride. And the attitudes of the church should be identical to the attitudes of a wife to a husband should be, because the attitude of Christ towards the church is exactly as the attitude a husband should be. Do you see what I'm saying? But that tells you that the father is preparing a wife for the son. We are already in courting. We're Jewish style wives. <laughs> We're not Gentile style wives. We're not dating Christ. We're betrothed to Christ. There's a big difference between dating Christ and betrothed to Christ. You know anybody who's dating Christ? I know people who are dating Christ. They are in love with him. They think he's great. But you know when he calls, they're probably washing their hair. They're not quite want to do it today. And then there's those who are betrothed to Christ. And he calls, and we're like the Shinnamite, a little sleepy. But we recognize his voice, and we sure do miss our lover, and we're going to get up there somehow, and, oh my, I was asleep. I didn't mean to be asleep. Sorry, Lord. Oh, come back, come back. Please come back. Go read the Song of Solomon. Come on. And that's what we do. Oh, he tried to reach me on Friday, and I didn't have time to pray. Oh, man. Now it's going to take me five days of unanointed prayer to find him again. No, we quit after the third day of unanointed prayer and blame him. Whoops. This is a problem. An American problem. A modern man problem. The machine didn't work when I put the quarter in. It's the machine's fault. <laughs> Did you plug it in? No. 
Did you give the car gas? No. Did you make sure that the oil was changed? No. Blame the manufacturer. This is modern man's problem. You see, the type of husband and wife is supposed to reflect a picture to the world of what the church is supposed to be because of what Christ is. Well, let's see. What does the picture of marriage in the world show us about the relationship of Christ and the church? <laughs> if he doesn't do what I want, I leave. If she doesn't do what I want, I leave. If it takes too long to do what we want, we leave. <laughs> and doesn't God want me to be happy? Happy is more important than anything else, right? Well, right now, I'm not very happy. The church I'm sitting in is just really like, you know, I'm like really unhappy. So if I'm unhappy, I guess that gives me grounds to go to another body. I'm just going to relocate my finger to another body someplace. I'm going to go attach it to the foot. Yeah, but I called you to that place, or I wanted you to do that, or I needed you in that ministry. Yeah, but you know, those people are a bunch of arrogant, and I don't care. And you know, I mean, <laughs> Come on. The body of Christ has lover's spats all the time. Little fights, little problems. But what Christ is saying here, and I, it hit me in the way I put this verse set in here. The wedding's coming, the wedding's coming, the guests are coming, the people are coming, the feast is coming, everything's getting ready, but the betrothed is having a bit of a problem. She's having a little tough time reverencing her husband right now. I'm talking about the church. Having a tough time reverencing her husband. Looking up to him. We look up to the Pope better than we do Christ sometimes. We look up to our civil leaders better than we do Christ sometimes. We have a real tough time reverencing Christ. Well, I don't know that he should require that of me. That's religion. No, that's his garment. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, he sent me a message. I got the message, but I'm not so sure I have to do it. Because after all, I'm the wife. I can make up my own mind, too. Say at the church. <laughs> He wants to sanctify it and cleanse it and wash it and watch over it and take care of it. He wants it to have no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I wonder how many people would attend church if all of a sudden Christ showed up in the middle of the church and said, Time for a bath. You guys stink. Okay, I'm being a little rough. But get the point. What if he showed up in my life and all of a sudden, yeah, you too. <laughs> I'd be embarrassed, man. Isn't it much more better, much more better, oh, that's English for you. Isn't it much more um, reasonable to just believe that since I'm the, I'm the bride of Christ, I can just be who I am because he accepts me as I am and I don't have to change really because I'm saved now and... I'm good for the rest of my existence. I'm all once saved, always saved. And it doesn't really matter whether I, you know, speaking as a, as a bride here, it doesn't really matter what I do. I mean, I found him, didn't I? He found me, didn't he? Praise God! We're married. We're betrothed. Whew. At least I don't have to date anymore. I don't have to keep going from religion to religion and church to church to figure out which one was the true husband. <laughs> I found my true husband. <sighs> There's two edges to the sword of the wedding, in my opinion. There's the pre preparation for the wedding, for being married, and then there's the your betrothed, and that preparation includes more than just preparing for a wedding. It's preparing to be wed. It's preparing to be one. It's preparing to be part. Jesus Christ is taking all the efforts and the church is going to have to respond much faster. And we are the church. And I am a member in particular. I am also a user. <laughs> Revelation 19.1 And following. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord thy God. Our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. He has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah. And her ro smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. 
And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the voice of many waters, the voice of a mighty thunderous, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife has made herself ready. Made herself ready. But you know what's funny about that? Based on the last verses I just read, he hath made her ready. He wanted to make sure she was without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He was helping. Kind of a little different than the way we do weddings here. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white. Here, let's trade robes. Here, let's swap clothing. Your rags for my riches. What do you think? Cool. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they, blessed are they, that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. There's a marriage supper of the Lamb. There's a feast to go with this wedding. There are guests that will be attending it. They will know of a certain who the bride was. And you know, I was reading a segment of Romans this morning for a minute. The segment that talks about, and it might even be in my message for all I remember now, talks about Israel being cut off, but not utterly fallen. Israel being for the Gentiles' sake, and Gentiles being for the Israelites' sake. God's going after the rest of the world to provoke Israel to jealousy. Bride, guess. Could have been bride, guess. Origi originally, Israel was supposed to be the one to go save the rest of the world. Now the rest of the world is trying to save Israel. In the end, his feast will be full. His wedding will be complete. Jesus is trying to make a very, very definitive point to the Israelites he's talking to. Because remember, he's talking to the lost sheep of Israel right now. <coughs> he's saying, there's a wedding coming. There's a bride and you can be part of it. But if you don't want to be part of it, I'm going to go get me a bride. And if you don't want to be part of the wedding feast, I'm going to go get me guests for the wedding feast. But I will have my feast. And the king is going to have a supper for his son. And when that supper is done, then we start ruling the kingdom together with a rod of iron, breaking potsherds where necessary. That's when the bride starts taking on a whole different picture. John the Baptist was called the friend of the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom. He came beforehand. The bride comes afterhand. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be wonderful. Proverbs 6 1. Now we move into the rest of the punch of this sermon. Proverbs 6 1. And I'm going to go to 6 4. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thy eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which, having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. You had desires in God, but you just didn't follow through. There's a warning in this verse that's haunted me for years on and off. It's actually helped motivate me on a few occasions. But today I saw it spiritually instead of naturally. Yeah, I guess so. I guess we can kind of get get religiously sluggard. <laughs> go to church, get up, go to work, go to church, get up, go to work, go to up. Preacher preaches a good message. Did you study the word this week? No. I come to listen to the preacher. The preacher preaches the good message. Did you pray this week? Well, yeah, some. But mostly I pray to church. Every day, every day, we have something to do. The servants in the household, imagine the servants in the household of a rich king who decided, 
Well, we're not going to cook Monday through Friday. I think maybe we'll cook on Saturday only. How hungry, then, would the children be? How happy, then, would the father be? We all have a responsibility in the kitchen. Some of us have di diaper poopy cleanup duty. <laughs> Some of us have got to do counseling. Can you know that? It's all counseling is. A lot of it. You know, people puking up their pain. There are people who do cleanup duty eight hours a day for us. There are people who help people who are losing their marbles. I don't mean that in the wrong way. I mean in the right way. We all have our duties. But the truth of the matter is we all have our same, the same disease. Just a little slumber, just a little sleep, just a folding of the hands. I always thought that was funny. Folding of the hands to sleep, you know? Your hands were doing something. And, and I don't know, I, I, I don't know how you fall asleep, but I know what I feel sometimes as I'm going away. <laughs> All of a sudden my hands get very peaceful. <laughs> and my feet get very peaceful. And then my legs and arms get very peaceful. And I have a joke with myself. I say, ah, I'm becoming one with the chair. <laughs> it's called a recliner for a reason. <laughs> Ah, but the warning, the warning, thy poverty shall come on thee <clears throat> like a man who's armed. You know, oh, well, I guess I better watch out for spiritual poverty, huh? Well, why is it the church is so naked, wretched, and poor? Uh, she sleepeth. How come she's short of oil? She sleepeth. Proverbs 13:4. The soul of the slugger desires and has nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The soul of the sluggard, oh, I, I want to be used of God. I want to be used of God. Now that's going to cost you three hours of prayer a day for the next three years. Oh, man, that's dry. That's like really dry. I, I went and prayed for two whole weeks and God never showed up. I had a discussion with my neighbor this week. It was interesting. We were talking about feeling the presence. And he said, so let me see if I understand this correctly. You're saying to me that I should just keep praying even if I don't feel the presence. I said, well, sure. Who are you doing it for, you or him? What is prayer? Prayer is laying a petition before God so that the king will go into action. Did he say he's going to give you a goblet of fine wine every time you present a case in front of his court? No. Our responsibility is be messengers mediators, priests. Lord, this guy over here says, that guy over there says, this person over here needs, that person over there needs. <coughs> you know? So give me a report from my faraway lands, O oh ambassadors. Well, Your Honor, over here, I, you know, O oh King out here in the land of Wooby Wooby that you gave me territorial rights over. I've got a flood problem, I've got a this problem, I've got a that problem, and we desperately need some funds and some reserves, and we could use a few soldiers to take care of these thugs that seem to be sneaking in, and, and that's what we have at the moment, O oh King. And the King looks over at his court, court writer person, you know, the guy who writes it all down. So did you get all that? Yeah, I got it, Your Honor. All right, next case. I'll de decide these matters in judgment in my court, in my, in my chambers when I go to sleep, when I go to rest. You know? And then you get to go home. You delivered your petition to the king. But he didn't tell me if he'd give it to me. That's right, he didn't. He's a king. He gets to decide now or later. His choice. And in about two weeks, you get a knock, knock, knock from an angel on the door. Daniel, that which thou petitioned has been heard of the king. Took us 21 days to get here. Oh. Well, I'm glad you arrived. No, we're too busy looking for our touchy Phoebe. It's so funny, because from one side of the table, I love Pentecost, because the Lord is so gracious to give us all kinds of experiences. On the other side, you got to admire them Baptists, who week after week after week don't feel anything and keep on covering the ground. Lord, we got three sick cases of cancer, four cases of this, four cases of that. If it be thy will, heal it. Okay, we don't like the if it be thy will statement. But on the other hand, what do we do? Sometimes we do it the other way. If I don't feel anointed, it ain't, it doesn't, it ain't gonna work. Uh huh. It's all about us. Proverbs ten five. Proverbs ten five. I have looked that one up on my Bible. It got chopped off. Psalms. Proverbs ten. 
Proverbs 10, 5. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son. He that sleeps in harvest is a son that causes shame. Say ye not, four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. What are you doing sleeping? John 4.35 doesn't add that verse. I added it. What are you doing sleeping in the harvest? It's harvest time. Somewhere, someplace, there is somebody who is right on the edge of getting saved. And you've got the sickle in your hand. Somewhere, someplace, there's a whole field of them. And a church is going to be born in a day and a thousand are going to come in the door. Just like that because that field is ready. This field over here is hard soil, bad ground, a few pieces of wheat coming up, and a lot of tares. And God's going to strip that soil, take down those tares, and grow that wheat. It's happening all over the place. Neighborhoods that haven't had a church with any kind of anointing for 50 years, all of a sudden getting a church with an anointing. Because that field is getting ready. Maybe God had to let that soil sit for 50 years because, quite frankly, there was no nutrition left in the entire neighborhood. He couldn't so much as plant a seed of the Word of God in that place anyway. He had to wait for a whole generation to die out. And that generation's of kids die out. And then he finally gets new neighbors that he can work on. New soil. It's possible. But the harvest is out there. We haven't prayed ourselves yet to the right souls. We haven't seen all the right people yet. We are limited. I admire people who can get on an airplane and talk to people and get them saved on airplanes. I'm not one of those people. I tried a couple of times. Those people haven't talked to me since. <laughs> Try to tell people on an airplane when they're a captive audience. You know, they smile real nice. But boy, when they get off that plane, they run like crazy. <laughs> on the other hand, I was thinking the other day, man, I stand in the middle of a mall or I stand in the middle of a grocery store. How many thousands of people do I go by per week? And some of them are harvestable, and I just don't know how to reach them. Maybe I'm too sleepy to reach them. Maybe I don't have my goggles on and I can't see. Maybe my gifts aren't fully operative and I really should have them functional. Proverbs 24:33. Yeah, I already read it. <laughs> I must be a really important verse. <laughs> Little sleep, little slumber, little folding of the hands. Romans 10, 7 and following. God makes a statement about Israel and he says this. It is written, God has given them the spirit of slumbers. That's verse 8. Eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. He, he tucked them in and started the Gentile age. He tucked them in because they weren't listening. He says, all right. You get to go sleep for a little while, but not for long. Isaiah 56.10, God says this statement. His watchmen are blind. They are ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Bought myself this bulldog, and he just loves to snore. <laughs> get him, Rover! <laughs> Let us not be dumb dogs. Can't bark. Too tired. Laying down. Loving to go to church, but not anything else. But bless God, at least I know God is on my side because I attended the pew this week. At least I can say I'm a Christian. I've been faithful to go to church this week. I've sat at my master's table every day of my life. He pets me behind the ear every now and then. It's great to have an experience in God. Oh. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the master says, Come on, let's go hunting! And the dog goes, Huh? I was enjoying having my ear scratched, thank you. <laughs> I want to go hunting! Get me some pheasant! The dog goes, Huh? <laughs> it's a sad thing when the watchmen are blind, sleeping, spirit of slumber. Mark 14.32 This Garden of Gethsemane We all know what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? 
The master was going to face his darkest hour and the church rallied to support him in prayer in his darkest hour so that he'd be able to make it through that trial with the full backing of the body of Christ. Bless God! Right after the crucifixion and in comes the kingdom of God. Right? Right. <laughs> right. He says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Please stick by me and watch. I need you near me, okay, you guys, you three? You're my buds. I've asked you to stick with me. This is the hardest time of my life. If I fail at this, you guys don't have a Savior. Will you, will you stick with me? If I fail at this, the world doesn't get saved. If I fail at this, it could cost me my soul. Oh, surely not. Number two can't possibly have a problem. Number two, number five, number seven, please stand in line. The truth of the matter is, Jesus needed his friends. And he only asked that they stick around with him a little while. Okay, so you had a little bit of dinner beforehand, and you're a little bit, you know, digesting. <laughs> he went forward a little, fell on the ground, prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He didn't want it. In his soul, it was like, oh man, this is going to be so rough. So rough. said, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. If it's possible, take it away. Is there another way? Do I absolutely, absolutely have to do this? Are you sure I have to do this? I'm willing to do this. But are you sure I have to do this? Yes, son, you have to do this. Really? Are you absolutely sure I have to do this? <laughs> okay, Lord. Nevertheless, not what I will. That means something, you know. It doesn't mean nothing. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to the crucifixion. Hallelujah, I'm going to die for the world. Hallelujah. No, it was, it was, okay. All right. All right. All right. I'll do the calling. All right. I'll surrender. I'd be much better to be in heaven with you, but it's more needful that I be there for them. You know what they call that? He cometh and findeth them sleeping. Says Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch for one hour? I needed 60 minutes out of you. 60 minutes. Man, that's an awful long time to pray. Tell somebody that they should be praying an hour a day and see what your reaction is. Man, that's a long time to pray. Doesn't God hear us the first time? <laughs> Watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and praying and spake the same words. He went through that same routine a second time. And when he returned, he found them asleep again. Their eyes were heavy, heavy eyes. Neither wist they what to answer him. Uh, dumb dogs. Sleepy dogs. And he cometh a third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now. Take your rest. Ooh, that hurts. It's okay, Balaam. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can go on up. Go on. Go on. When the Lord says, stop, and the Lord says, stop, and the Lord says, stop, and the Lord says, go, or vice versa, go, and the Lord says, go, and the Lord says, go, and then all of a sudden he says, stop, your stomach should hurt. I know mine has when it's happened. Take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. I made it through my prayer time. Sorry you couldn't have been there. You guys who enjoyed the Mount of Transfiguration with me couldn't give me an hour in the Garden of Suffering. Oh, we love our experiences in God. And we sleep doing the rest. May we be changed by our Master. Luke 22:45. Why sleep ye? Rise and pray. Re rise and pray. Lest you enter into temptation. Be careful. The temptation to sleep is very strong and the temptation that's following afterwards, if you're groggy, you won't have the stamina to stand against accusation. Peter fell. You won't have the stamina to believe that Christ is coming back in three and a half days. They all went back to fishing. You won't have the stamina to know that it's the right thing when the body disappears and you don't know where it went. Because you didn't pray up ahead of time for all that. Praise God that he still got a church out of this. There is a cry to be awake. 
there is a cry to be awake. Romans 13.11 Knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Every day you're getting closer to your finalization of your salvation. So keep awake. Keep moving. Keep going. Help me to keep go going. Keep praying over me. Lord, don't let him fall asleep. I've actually felt myself fall asleep in areas. You know how I know I'm asleep if I'm asleep in a spiritual area? I remember doing it somewhere in the past, but I can't remember how to do it now. Something went asleep. There's a sense of, uh, can I even do that anymore? <clears throat> I had an, a, an incident a couple of weeks ago when it came to sermons. Time to do a sermon. Didn't feel a thing. Ooh. Spirit of the Lord lifting? Spirit of the Lord leaving? Or sleepy saint? I chose the sleepy saint answer for 500, and you guys got a sermon that week. I chose the, oh, why art thou disturbeth, O thy soul? Awaketh thou, and go sit in front of the computer, and let the Lord write a sermon. It's hard. Oh, it's hard. Some of these sermons that, that have been coming over the last year, they haven't always been easy. People think I love talking a lot. I don't think I do. I just do it a lot. <laughs> okay, I might like it a little. But the truth of the matter is coming up with sermons to feed you guys and make sure that it's food instead of just giving you intellectual banter and the latest research off of the thing that I could have read and, you know, read you a little bit of Josephus maybe and get you all excited about archaeology and, you know. All I'm trying to say is there are times even my soul feels like I'm falling sleepy by and I have to trim my wick and i got to get up and i got to check the lamp and i got to make sure. You know, you get up in the morning and go to work, and you always wake up every morning going to work with a look, a smile on your face, a, this is going to be a great day at work. Right? Right. Right. No, we all have tricks we do to ourselves to make sure we get up. We all do things of, come on, come on. You know, we all have to motivate ourselves to get out of sleep. It, it's no different, spiritually speaking. You have to say to your soul, come on, it's prayer time. Come on, flesh man, I know you don't like it. You have to say to yourself, I'm going to get up and put the CD in the machine when really I'm perfectly comfortable here. Go put the CD in the machine, you know. Or in my case, I'm going to go for a drive now and put a, <laughs> put a CD in my new car. Because, <laughs> you know what's really funny? I'm going to do a 10 second sidebar. I've been grumping for years because I haven't had a CD player in my car, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think I'll take my CDs out to my car so I'll play them? I don't want to carry the box out to the car. Oh, do I carry one CD or five CDs? I don't know. Oh, none of them sound good. Now I'll wait till tomorrow to play my CDs. That one hit me this Saturday morning. It was like, what an idiot. <laughs> what a sleepy idiot, <laughs> you know? I got two and a half hours. I'm going to be traveling from hither to yon. I can put on some Kim Hill. I can put on some, you know, whoever. No, I'm going to be too lazy to take the CDs out to the car. Because <laughs> I'm too sleepy. <laughs> no, do what you got to do. I know I'm supposed to be listening to more music because it changes my soul. And the days I do, it works. The days I don't, don't. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, through 4, 4, 14 through 4, 18. I'm going to have to read that one from my Bible, too. I'm almost done with this sermon. I know I'm past time, but just a few more minutes. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4. Four fourteen. excuse me. I said, I said it wrong again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. The devil is called the prince of the power of the air. It's a figure of speech that means that other realm. Catch on to that. Verse 18, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. You're going to get to abide with him like that forever. When he returns in the second coming, he is going to be coming to stomp and set up government on earth. But when he comes for the saints first, he's going to have himself a wedding preparation. I firmly believe in that which people say doesn't going to happen. I believe there will be a rapture. I believe there will be a saints gathered unto him prior to him coming back with the saints. We may argue over the date, the time, the place, but I guarantee you the events. Comfort one another with these words. Don't get sleepy. Keep talking to one another. Keep reminding each other. He's coming. Don't get tired. 1 Thessalonians 5.1 But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. That's the day of the Lord. Did you catch that? The day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Go read all the passages on the day of the Lord and you'll find out the day of the Lord is the day of judgment. For when they shall say, they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman and child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, uh, verse 4, I'm going to have to jump to it, it didn't print it. I'll skip it for the moment anyway, it's okay. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. We are ready to understand what's coming. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. Isn't that how we started this sermon? Virgins sleeping in the night. And they may, that they may be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath. Catch it. God has not appointed us to wrath. Go study the day of the Lord. You'll see it's a day of wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not appointed to the wrath that's coming upon the ungodly for all the ungodly deeds which the ungodly have committed. Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, notice whether we wake or sleep, whether we're dead in Christ or still alive when the event happens, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Excuse me. Etc. Ephesians 5.14 Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Second Thessalonians 3.13 But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Well-doing. Don't get weary. Don't let yourself get weary. It, trust me. You know it, I know it, we all know it. We get tired. Anything we have to do over and over and over again gets boring after a while. Even prayer can get boring after a while. Reading your Bible can get boring after a while. Going to church can get boring after a while. Serving the Lord doesn't get boring. The anointing comes with it. And it will carry you. But, if he appoints you as a watchman and you have to stand still and he doesn't bother to anoint you, he just says, stay put, it could get boring but you better not move from your post. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We are not to sleep, but there is a rest that replaces sleep. And you have to know that. Come unto me, all ye that, are, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Hebrews 4, 1 through 11, which is the last set of verses. I'll let you go read it because my time's run out, so to speak. But if you read that passage, you find out that God says over and over and over and over again, there is a rest yet to the people of God. Your belief, your faith will bring you into a place of rest. See, the reason we sleep is because we feel tired. 
because we think we need rest from what we're doing. I know of people who have said, I'm going to take a break from God. I know people who have said, I'm going to take a break from church. I know people who have said, I'm going to take a break from callings and ministries. I'm going to go get me some rest. The problem is, they're kind of like some of those marriages where the mate says, we just need a little bit of separation time for now. Maybe a year or so. Then we'll see where our marriage stands. And a year goes by, and two years goes by, and five years goes by, and you're still not. It's very easy for us to say, I'm just going to slumber for 15 minutes. I just need 15 minutes, Lord. I just want to not do spiritual things or a spiritual 15 minutes. And five years later, you go, wow, I haven't done that in five years. What happened? And you realize you've been asleep in that area. You slept. You, you didn't mean to. You were just putting ministry on hold for 15 minutes. You were just putting your spirituality on hold for... You were just not going to partake of religion for... And then you wake up one day and realize, oh my goodness, I've denied the Lord for ten years. I walked away and didn't know it. I backslid. Maybe I didn't sin a lot, I just backslid. The Lord is willing to bring anybody back. The Lord is willing to rescue everybody. And I guarantee you, He is going to wake up everybody. <clears throat> He's going to wake up everybody. But we have to be ready for it. The wedding is coming. Get ready. Lamb's wife. Get ready. The wedding is coming. Shake sleep. Trim your oil. Fill your oil. Trim your lamp. Get yourself ready. Trust the Lord. And rest inside, not outside. Jesus, thank you for this message. Thank you for adding to it, Lord, and thank you for writing it, for having written it down. We bless your name. Amen.